Hey, Roger, how's it going for you, man? Hey, Scott, I'm doing well. How are you doing? All right. Good. I was talking to uh, Mark Z last night and we were talking about you and we didn't say the, you know, say anything more, but you know, it was, he was like, Whoa, I got to watch him. I'm like, yeah, we'll have it on. Um, I think well, I try not to are... disappoint. How's that? Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> it's all good. But I, I think this is Friday. Today's Friday, the uh, 25th. And I think I'm going to have it on for Monday because we already had something I had recorded for Friday. So you guys are going to see this on Monday. Um, probably about in the morning with that too. And uh, so you'll be able to see some more. Now, I was going to have Sheriff Mac people. Um, my internet went down all morning, so I couldn't get anything done. I had to reschedule him to November 6th. So everyone will kind of see him at that time frame with that too. So, okay. So, hey, Roger, I want to ask you this. Tell me a little bit about your legal background with that. I have... Um... I, I will say in excess of 30 years in the law. Actually, it's more than that, but I'll, I'll leave it at 30. Um, been, been a practicing attorney for uh, about 25 years. Uh, I do have what I would refer to as a paralegal or a non-attorney type background in the law as well. I've worked for a nonprofit associations representing small business, uh, worked for uh, state and local governments, uh, the uh, uh, number of global businesses as well as domestic businesses in a variety of different capacities. But most of that work is focused upon what I would refer to as legislative and administrative advocacy on behalf of the client. Right. So when you first contacted me, I was like so excited. You know, you and I talked for like an hour and a half first time, an hour and a half the next time. And, you know, we will get off, you know, go on everywhere with it. But I was so excited that you know, you're so awakened and you, you know, understood the law. You were telling me things. I'm like, okay, I'm wrong on that one. I'm wrong on that one. And, and that's kind of how it is that most of us are looking at this thing. You know, we see so many things that are wrong in the world and we see them legally, but we don't know how to, uh, how to address that, you know? And, and that's, that's what I'm excited for you with that too, because it leads me into this kind of next point here. You know, what does constitutional law even mean? We've heard this with Nasara, and, you know, we're going to kind of go back to a constitutional law. Um, what does that mean? Well, I, th I think there's a couple of different ways to look at that. Um, for most people that have a an understanding of the law, constitutional, and when I say understanding, I'm talking about like paralegals, attorneys, people who have been around the law in different capacities. Right. They, they look at constitutional law as being based upon the United States Constitution and based upon the Bill of Rights um, and the other amendments in the Constitution. And they look at the constitutional, the, the basis for constitutional law is providing that framework that was uh, created at the beginning of our nation and that we rely on for making decisions. Probably most frequently those decisions come in the form of contracts but they also come in, I think, two important areas. Uh, the first area is identifying what the rights and responsibilities of government is. It, it, it establishes, for example, in the first three articles of the Constitution, the roles and responsibilities of the executive branch, uh, excuse me, of the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And again, those are important because it lays that framework out. And then it proceeds to talk about other types of issues that impact our government, for example, um, how we amend the Constitution, how we go about prescribing powers to the states, how we look at creation of these, what I'll call subcategories within each of the three branches. So, uh, for example, in the legislative branch, we know that we have a variety of different agencies that the Congress relies upon, uh, Congressional Budget Office, we have a policy office, we have a variety of other support mechanisms that enable members of Congress to do their job and okay. help provide the staff for that. In the executive branch, we have agencies and the agencies or executive agencies allow the president to perform the functions that the president does. So for example, we'll have um, the Office of Management and Budget, we'll have different individual agencies that operate in a way that helps them perform their duties under the constitution. In the judicial branch, we have the Supreme Court and then the later creation of lower courts, which have helped to provide the process of determining whether or not the uh, statutes passed by Congress 
uh, the actions done by the executive are constitutional. In other words, do they meet the muster in review of the Constitution? Right. And along those lines, we have seen over time uh, development of things called precedents, and we have seen the development of things called stare decisis. So, and, and what that means say that say that last one again stare decisis, and it's okay. S T A R E, and the second word D E C I S. Okay. Um, S and I S. So, what we ha- what that means is that in in the first one, precedent. Many times, the courts will look to whether or not a case in front of them has been previously decided, and my interpretation in reading the Constitution is that while the Constitution understood that there would be growth in government, they never, the constitutional founding fathers never envisioned our growth in government to be what it is today. And I'll touch on that a little bit later when I get into the administrative law portion. Uh, the second part of that, the, the stare decisis essentially says that um, if the court has previously ruled on a case, that holding stands. So many times you might bring a matter to the court and the court will look at it and you might say, I got a great case here. I'm trying to challenge um, a a previous ruling by the court. And the court will say, no, we're going to um, not take up your case on the basis of stare decisis. We have already spoken on the issue and there's no need to further address that. You mean that particular court, but you could move it up. Up, up um, the, up right. The, I, I, and that particular court, but most often the stare decisis cases are coming out of the Supreme Court. So there, uh-huh. there's there's been litigation of issues through the courts. And then the Supreme Court will say, no, we've already decided that. And they may point you to another case that they've decided. And they will say that they'll go through the discussion of how they interpret that particular case and the ruling on that case. And then in the end, they'll say that um, we are going to either dismiss or uphold this case on the basis of stare decisis. Because you brought up something new to explain it, or you didn't do enough information to to to, uh, to take it in a new direction. Yes, yes. Right? yes. Okay. And, and so what what they'll do is they'll essentially say, "Well, you know, thank you for bringing the argument forward. However, our previous decision in this area stands." Right. And I think, in particular, what's important about the, the stare decisis, and I'll, again, I, I apologize for jumping around here, but it's no, it's great. It's like we're looking at a kind of a woven fabric here, if you will, with the Constitution. Um, we, we talk about, for example, the Chevron Doctrine. And the Chevron Doctrine is probably one of the, the perfect um, stare decisis um, examples that we can have. Um, they gave great deference to administrative agencies to make decisions and, and engage in certain activities where Congress had failed to do that as their duty under the Constitution. And for a long time, the court said, that's fine, we're going to uphold it. And what we ended up with is we had some newer justices on the court who took a look, took a look at a new case that come along and said, wait a minute, that is not correct. We need to overturn that. And so here today, going forward, we are going to reverse that decision. And in the process of doing that, they didn't overturn all the previous decisions that were made. They just overturned that decision in this particular case that was brought before them, uh, having to do with the EPA. So so that, that that's an important distinction to think about. The other part of it is that if we look at precedents, usually a court will cite precedents in a case and they'll look at, um, originally the precedents was supposed to be based upon uh, judicial interpretations or judicial of rulings right? of the constitution, yes. And, and then we started getting into this issue of where Congress makes laws. And, and in our country, we have what's referred to as a hierarchy of the law. And the, the hierarchy of the law starts with the Constitution being the, the, the ultimate law of the country, followed by statutory law, which is created by the Congress, followed by federal administrative agency interpretations, followed by court cases which is kind of an odd way to look at it. But in essence, what happened was the administrative state through the passage of the Administrative Procedures Act in 1946 was given a huge amount of power to essentially shortcut decisions getting to the courts. So go, go back to 1946. I mean, was it, um, wasn't that the same kind of time frame that you had the CIA and a lot of those three letter agencies coming out or am I missing something? No, no, you're, 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 you're almost correct. In, in uh, 1933 and 34 with the advent of the great depression, 
uh, FDR and the Democrats got together and said, you know, we need to create new agencies to help address the concerns of Americans. So, for example, they had, you know, the Securities and Exchange Commission was created. They had the financial um, uh, financial uh, statutes that they passed to regulate banking, to regulate right. stock trades, transactions, um, stock ownership of individual corporations. You know, we had the creation uh, of um, health care. Uh, right, like Department, Department of Rehab Services kind Department of Department of Rehab Services, yes. Uh, we had housing laws passed. We had a whole variety of things passed. And what they did is they built the bureaucracy at that time uh, uh, to a very large point. But the problem they had is that when they, they created all these different opportunities and in individual government bureaucracies, there was no mechanism in place for the average person or business to come forward and say, oh, wait a minute, I got an issue with what you're doing. <laughs> Okay. So what they did in 1946, they got together and passed the Administrative Procedures Act. And what that act did is it actually set out requirements of what the agencies would do before they enacted regulations. So, so they, they set the tent pegs up for, you know, any particular group in essence. Would yes. That be right? okay. Yes, that is correct. So and, and if I'm if I'm going through this too fast, just let me no, know. No, no, don't, don't awesome. we'll keep bouncing around. And okay. guys, if you like what we're doing, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you, Mayor. But sure. you guys like what we're doing. You're going to leave comments. Um, but I, I'm going to tell you, we're probably going to have Roger back at least one more time because because we're going to keep going through some of these things. So people have a clue about them. Yes. And, and I will tell you, one of the things I believe is really important, and I've spent a number of years dealing with the Administrative Procedures Act on a federal and state level. Um, I, I just want to stop here and mention that whatever I'm talking about from a federal perspective is repeated at the individual states. So right. they have a state constitution, their, their state laws, uh, their state administ administrative procedures act, and a uh, state bureaucracy that does the same thing. We have uh, this to a lesser extent at the local level, and you know, local units of government will have either a charter or they'll have uh, some type of a collection of ordinances that will set out and establish um, how that community is going to be developed and decided and how they're going to uh, place power in in the administrative function of that community but it, it always almost always has uh, a legislative body an executive body whether it's a mayor or a county administrator and then it's got a judicial system which is going to be your courts uh, and again the courts are at local county and state levels as well so uh, the reason this is important, I think, as at least as I look at it, is so the Administrative Procedures Act established the process whereby people would at least be given an opportunity to make some type of a formal response to rules that were being established. And what the Administrators Proce Administrative Procedures Act, I'll just call it the APA, okay. what they actually laid out is they said before um, a new process can be put in place, the agency will have to prepare a proposed rule for a proposed rulemaking process, and they will have to publish that rule in the Federal Register. Now, what's interesting about that is that if you go to the Federal Register, I mean, it, it is a voluminous set of documents that's printed oh, yeah. virtually every day with all types of information in it, but they now had to put their proposed rules in those documents. And they also had to identify what they were, they had to give an opportunity for comment. And what a lot of um, people don't understand is that when you look at the comments that are there, they'll have a period of comment, for example. And, right. and I've done this several times with different types of government agencies. So they'll they'll propose a document and um, we'll just call it a, a set of rules, which will eventually become a rule that will outline whatever that function is going to be. So for people like myself and others uh, who are representing clients that hire us to do this, uh, or individuals can do this too if they have an interest in doing it, but you know, they're not getting paid to do it. Whereas people like myself, we're getting paid to do this. So we we sit here and we go through the document. We take a look at how that document's going to impact our client. And mm. so, for example, we will propose changes for that proposed rule, and we'll have a certain period of time to get those changes in. Once they go to the agency, then the agency has an opportunity to review those proposals they may decide to accept them, they may incorporate them into the document, or they may just say, you know what, this this is too new of a change and we're not going to take this now. Right. Uh, at, at either rate, what they do is they take a summary of what is proposed and then they will they will put that uh, as an attachment to the new rule that comes out. Hmm. So, for example, you can see what some of the thinking was that went into 
why the rule was either amended, changed, or somehow dealt with during that process. And what's interesting is that if you look at a lot of the different rules that are out there today, I mean, those rules impact virtually every aspect of American society. Right. Uh, they act. They will. They will impact business. They will impact labor. They will impact uh, churches. They will impact schools. They will impact uh, individuals. Whether you are a um, a, a free individual who can walk around without disabilities or someone who has a handicap or a disability to deal with. They will impact people regardless of race, color, or creed. They will impact everybody to one extent or the other. The difficulty is no one reads them when they're out there. They find yeah. out about them when they get, when something happens. And well, and, and to, to that that's point. That's why it's so complicated. I, and to that point, and you and I talked a little bit about this, but I'm going to give you just a personal kind of situation. And I want to say 2017, and I might get the principles exactly, I mean, a little bit wrong on that. Um, I always call her Hiawatha because that's, you know, or Pocahontas that, that Trump calls her. Um, Elizabeth Warren, yes. and I believe it's Grassley that came up with a concept called the over-the-counter hearing aids. Now, they, um, it was proposed, and, and when you kind of go behind the scenes, um, <clears throat> what was happening in there is that you... You had Bose who was giving millions of dollars, and that's where that's where it gets really ugly here. And so they sprinkle in all the dollars, and then they start, you know, they start um, basically poisoning almost everyone around you. Now, again, what they were, what the whole goal of a, like this thing called over-the-counter hearing aids was to try to, you know, have another cost option. Um, all hearing aids are governed by the FDA through 510K reports. <laughs> That have this conversation of, hey, wait, you have to have a prescriptive, you know, type of hearing aid. It has to be done by a state licensed persons, and you know, there's all kinds of other regulations around it. But the the OTC, the over the counter, was trying to skirt the rule, and they kept skirting the rule in, in many ways. And one of the things that got us really sideways. Listen, I could care less if if another agency wants to come in and start selling, you know, online things happens all the time. It's been happening for 20 years before this thing ever came out. But what I got really upset about is they started bringing up things like, and the FDA put it in and they put it through as a rule, is this thing called perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. And I was like, what in God's name does that even mean? Because it means, you know, per who perceives it? The patient perceives it. And now we have to, you know, do a prescriptive point. And so what they did is they 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 went around the professionals, and then everyone when it once it came in, and I remember commenting on that, and I said, this is this is ludicrous, you know, and 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 so did a lot of people. We all commented on it, and we felt like we got nowhere with them. And then what what occurred on the back end is they put it in, and then everyone said, okay, that's the rule, and so we're going to embrace it. And I still say. To this day, it's a fraudulent rule. I mean, it's a fraudulent kind of uh, a bill in that way. And you you were telling me something interesting about it related to the the Federal Register, if you remember. Yes. Well, and and okay. So the process of the proposed rulemaking is you have an opportunity for comment. They collect the comments, they go through and digest them, and then they put out the their their final rule. They call it. Once the final rule comes out, there is a document called regulations.gov where you can actually go in and file a rebuttal opinion to that particular rule. Now, does that move you any place or change the rule? No, it doesn't, but it gives yeah. you an opportunity to identify what's taking place there. Now, okay, so from my perspective, when I look at the, um, the descriptive term that you use that nobody ever heard of, um, I've dealt with a few of those in the past. And so what I've tried to do is I've tried to take that term and say, OK, look, it's a term nobody understands. So let us write a definition. Right. What that term could be. Or in the alternative, we'll say, OK, if we give you that definition, then you at least at least need to have a couple of alternative definitions that could be available because of potential economic impact Correct. on businesses if those are not there. And I'm not saying that those are always adopted, but again, that's that's one of the things that you get familiar with as you go through and deal with these issues more and more. You, you have to think about what the regulator is trying to do and how you can address what uh, they're trying to ask 
And so, again, that's one of the benefits of having hired people help you with that. But it's also a benefit of having an opportunity to not only be aware of, but understand the fact that there's a chance that they can modify the rule because these rules are put together by faceless bureaucrats that sit within government who write this thinking they understand what's taking place. And most often they don't. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're clueless on the thing. And I remember writing letters to every single one of the uh, representatives and, and senators in my district. And it was all, they all wrote me a letter back, which is fascinating. And, 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 and I was being nice about it, but I was being very pointed on, on several issues that it was a problem with. And they all came back and said, no, you're the problem. This is a great thing. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And, and so I guess what, what you kind of, you know, I mean, there's, a, there's extra processes here, but what it, it made me feel like, and every single time that I've had to wade into it, it made me feel like I had no voice and you bureaucrats don't listen to us and don't care about us. And it kind of gets me back into this Chevron doctrine that, you know, I'd love you to kind of say something about that a little bit more that, because people ask about it all the time and they, they sort of caught it, but you believe something really interesting about it. I, I do. Yes. So, okay. So what happens with a lot of activity on the federal level? So the Congress will somebody will have an idea for a bill right. and they drop their bill in and it's actually, it's not actually the member of Congress who's writing the bill. It's a staff person. And so my, pri my practice over the years has been, if I see a bill that comes in, while it's nice to try and have contact with the member of Congress or the Senator, I need to find the staff person who is responsible for writing uh -huh. that bill. I also need to know who the staff person is on the committee that's going to be hearing that bill because they're going to give me the inside scoop about what's going on. Right. Once I know who those people are and I understand their approach, that gives me an opportunity to be creative and identify different ways that we can begin to um, attach the legislation or attack the legislation, if you will, and right. create alternatives to it and see if that's an option. Uh, if that works, um, if the, the representative or senator uh, staff is supportive of it after they've talked to their boss, then many times that will help in committee. Uh, if we get enough people in the committee who are interested in doing that, then they can help us work with the committee staff person who's responsible for shepherding that bill through the process. Now, that doesn't guarantee results when it gets to the House or Senate floor, but no. what it does is it creates an opportunity. And the most important thing is that as they go through preparing these bills, there's always a uh, legislative write-up about what the bill is, what its intended consequences are. And the more information you have on what the negative impact of that particular matter is going to be on, on business, on industry, on the public, on individuals, the greater impact you have. And so that's, that's kind of behind the scenes uh, activity that takes place before you get there. Now, once this goes through, if it gets signed by the president, uh, or in, in the states, if it gets through the state legislature, it gets signed by the governor, then what's going to happen, you look at that, and if there are not specific guidelines placed in that piece of legislation, like the Congress or the state legislature says, we're going to punt. We're not going to get into the details. We're going to let a state, federal or state agency deal with it. Then you shift gears and you have to go to the individual federal agency or state agency who is dealing with writing the regulations for that. Right. So what that does is that actually starts another process whereby they go through the process of writing the proposals for this. Now, um, you mentioned earlier about um, money that's injected into the process. OK, I've, I've been around this. I've seen a lot of people that do this. I have always felt that money corrupted the process. So I don't I never dealt with money. people said you want to give so and so a campaign contribution. I said, no, that's not how I operate. I want to get to them on facts. I want to get to them on evidence. I want them to understand what their their activity is doing and how it's going to impact the people they represent, because I felt that was the most important approach to take. And so I would have no problem calling up an agency and saying, you know, who's who's writing the, the regs for this and get in touch with a person, have a conversation with them. You know, can I offer some ideas to you to do this? And I would I would have that behind the scenes and, and work that process through. Um, one of the other things that took place in the very early years of the Chevron Doctrine was a concept called regulatory flexibility. 
and it went by the nickname of Reg Flex. And Reg Flex's main purpose was to take a look at these new regulations that were coming out and give the small business community an opportunity to get a second tier created for that regulation. So if you had the mom and pop operations or the small businesses that had, let's say, less than 25 people or less than 50 people in there, That's me, you know, right? th th then you could get an exemption from the regulation or have a longer phase in period. And that seemed to be pretty popular in the 80s when this was going on. But over time, as the, the uh, bureaucracy became more powerful, they became less inclined to consider that. And unfortunately, the members of Congress, uh, and I say the House and the Senate and also state legislatures, kind of backed away from it, especially in states where you had progressive Democrat control. And, and I'm, not, I'm not taking a political stance against your, part of your political party or your viewpoint. I'm just saying that people who tend to be more conservative tend to be more, care, more concerned about the impact of their actions on the people but it doesn't working. mean that's why I put. I mean, I, that's why this one is one of the more classic cases because Grassley is a real good guy, real awakened in a lot of ways. And by the way, President Trump passed the bill too and and hailed it as a good thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, you guys! Again, none of you guys know anything about it. And um, it's it, you know, well, I, I don't want to go too far into that because it gets off on, on the weeds here, but. Sorry, I'll give, give you back into that, that point because your, your point is so powerful about, you know, these regulators that get in the middle of, of a law and they start messing with it. Yes. And, and, and the, the point I'm bringing that out is because I believe the reason people feel helpless is because they don't know. <laughs> right. they, they don't know how to access it. They don't have the wherewithal. They don't have the means. For example, if you're a small business owner and you belong to a small business association, and you identify that as an important issue, you're paying annual dues to help that interest group advocate on your behalf. If you're, say, a different size business, medium or large business, you know, you have your interest groups like the Chamber of Commerce or the manufacturers. If you're uh, labor interest, you have your labor organizations, nonprofits. Everybody has an interest group. And those interest groups are the ones that are directly involved in the process of trying to shape and create the laws and the regulations that go forward. But it's it's funny because especially in this case too, the the special interest groups. I mean, we had American Academy of Audiology and blah blah blah, all these different ones, and they were jumping in, talking a lot about it. Even the hearing aid manufacturers were talking about it. Most of them going, "Hey, hold on, you haven't defined a billion little pieces in here." But as soon as it went through, it was like everyone said, "Okay, we're going to go right with it. This is the best thing in the history of the world." And I'm still going again. You know, I, it, you, you didn't define anything. It's like in the NFL when you ask me, you know, what? how do you define a catch? And they've, they've regulated it so much that no one has a clue how, how to catch football anymore. Yes, as you know? long as it doesn't hit the ground. Right. And then and going, sometimes it does. <laughs> and then you go into, yeah, but, it, it, you know, so the, it doesn't meet the eye test. And, yes. and that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here in that way, too. So back in your point, too, you were saying a little bit about the Chevron doctrine. Yes. Yeah, so, so what happened with the Chevron doctrine, what they, they decided to do was um, provide an opportunity for the administrative state to chime in on these. And at the time, you know, we had the situation where we had um, we had Democrats in control of the Congress, uh, both the House and the Senate. We had a looming administrative state that was continuing to grow. And the interesting thing I will say about the administrative state during that time period is that a lot of the folks that were 1984 in, too, just so you guys know, yes, 1984, the, a lot of the people that were in there had already been in there for 15, 20 years that, that grew out during the Kennedy, the, the Kennedy years, the first, um, uh, administrative state population come through and a lot of them were beginning to retire around the late 50s, 60s, then came in the new group of folks. And you know, just to provide some clarification, a lot of the people that work in this category are people that have a master's in public administration or maybe a master's in finance or whatever the area might be for the agency they want to go into. And so they're there and their goal is to be a good member of the administrative state. So their goal is to try and do whatever they can to help that grow and protect that interest. And there's a, a close relationship between that administrative state and the Congress and the Senate, very close. You will see staff members moving back and forth between the two, it's that close.
Oh, really? Yeah. Like, I mean, they're working for him, and then they work for the for, the, for, the yes, senator for, kind of thing. And yes, for an example, you might have someone who uh, sits on the finance committee for a member of Congress, and then they'll migrate over to the SEC, or somebody from the SEC will come over to the Congress, and so they're they're kind of moving back and forth. So, really, I, I don't like to use the term inbred. But that's sort of what you have there, because you know, and and that creates really an impenetrable wall as far as being able to move certain things down the road. And so, yeah, they're still out of touch. I mean, they, they, they haven't ever, they've never done a job outside no. of there, and they don't have a clue what we're all sitting here smelling. And 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 so, the normal person, whether it's an audiologist like me or an auto parts store, going, you're you got to be kidding me, kind of thing. Yes. And and so what they do is they do this and then they, you know, again, uh, the administrative state has a collection of attorneys that will protect their interests. And so once we had the Administrative Procedures Act in play, then people said, OK, so then they come along and they say, OK, so what we're doing here is we are taking a look at trying to create a rule process and we're going to put the rules in place. Well, as part of the rules, what they do is they create what they refer to as a, a formal adjudication. Of the process. So if, if anyone who's ever had to deal with these rules, whether it be a tax issue or um, a health care issue or anything of that sort, you have to go through an administrative process. And before you can get into court, before a judge within the judiciary system, you have to fully adjudicate your claim within the bureaucracy. So right. they have what they refer to as administrative law judges. And these are essentially people that get appointed um, by the president. A lot of these people, you know, the president never sees them, but you know, there's, there's people that get those appointments and they go in there and their purpose is to adjudicate matters that come before that uh, bureaucratic agency. So little baby judges in essence, in each one of the, the FDA, for instance, or yes. whatever. So, so, and, and you watch some of those folks and they will start out as an administrative law judge and then they'll move their way up and then they might go to a, an appellate tribunal within the organization. And then from there, they might go to a federal district court oh, or an appellate okay. court. So, so my point is, is that so you have technically a legislative adjudication process within the agencies that eventually leads some people to move into the judiciary process. And again, if you've been feeding this up from the bottom, then you get people that say, no, we're, we're going to let that doctrine stand because they may have known somebody who was an ALJ that decided in favor of it. Right. So, I mean, you, so you sit here and you look at the, uh, the inbred relationship, if you will, that we have with government and, and how that impacts people. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm basically stating factual situations that take place with this, because if you walk into any college or university today and say, I want to get a master's degree in public administration, this is what you're going to learn. You're going to learn that there's power in the administrative state. You're going to learn that while you have to be aware of what everybody else does, the real power in government is the administrative state. Right. And so then you bring in these other agencies. I mean, these, these other uh, interests, if you will, like lobbyists, um, the media, interest groups, and they're all playing a role in this process, too. So they're, each of them have differing levels of influence with regard to how they accomplish what they need to accomplish. And if it's freaking them out. And you, you, you and I talked about this as well, but it's freaking them out. That's what. That's what social media is messing all of them up. Every time it turns around, they, they turn around, they're getting pressured um, from the social media sites that are way bigger than any of the media sites anymore. And that plays a role in it as well. It does. And whereas we were for a long time in this country accustomed to, you know, three or four or five media outlets that would yeah. report whatever they were told to report. <laughs> you know, now we have social media um, activities out there and we have people who are taking up personal causes and they are identifying the flaws that exist within the system. Um, you know, I, and I'll throw this out as one example. If we take a look, for example, at Department of Homeland Security. Now, I, I will confess, <laughs> I've done some work with them on behalf of a couple of clients and we have that that infamous group within there called the uh, Federal Emergency Management <laughs> Agency. Um, so, and I've done some work with them too for, for a client, but if we look at how they do things, when DHS was created, what um, the Bush administration did is they went through and they handpicked 
a variety of different agencies that the Congress was considering eliminating because they did not serve a purpose. So they were all pulled together and they were put into this, this entity called Department of Homeland Security. They were given law enforcement, quasi law enforcement powers, if you will. Right. And we run into them everywhere we go. And then we see things recently like the Secret Service that is not capable of doing its job. There's been issues with um, Homeland Security. There's been issues with TSA. There's all the uh, uh, Customs and Border Patrol, all these different agencies, INS. And, and all of those, um, again, were, were a bureaucratic outgrowth of Congress's failure to do its job. Right. And so that, that's kind of where we end up. So that's, that's why that Chevron doctrine was so critical, because it laid the framework and reinforced it for 40 years. And then now that this is why I believe we are in such an unprecedented, spa, uh, unprecedented space that when you look at the Chevron doctrine, it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't immediately. Now, I know a lot of people are saying this. It does not immediately kill off situations. But it basically, you know, pulls the stake, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, tent stakes out of position and say, you need to reestablish yourself based upon the Constitution instead of some little person in the agency. Because, I mean, the, President Trump actually made a comment one time and, you know, the, <laughs> it was a running com conversation in 2020 that there were. Um, there were regulatory people inside of a particular agency. He didn't name it, name it, but it was there for 30 years. And she's writing, you know, 30 years of, of supposed laws that no one had a clue that those were just regs and she's writing laws and she was never, you know, obviously she was never voted in to do that. That, that is correct. And, um, I will, I will, again, I will address this in kind of a different way here. There, there are people within these agencies who their main purpose is to write these regs. They'll move up within the civil service system. Um, if they're fortunate, they get into the senior executive service, and that wields absolute power within government for them to do what they need to do. And I'm sorry, just as a sidebar here, they have this book called The Plum Book that's out there. And so, for example, whenever the new presidents come in, they'll list all the different positions that are available for members of the public to apply for. But within that book, there are a lot of off limits jobs that nobody applies for. You can't. Those are the SES jobs. They are right. protected forever because they wield a substantial amount of power. Now, what's interesting is that if you going back to the people that are writing the regs, the vast majority of those people are just common everyday people that get a job. Right within the bureaucracy and get pay increases and everything else uh, I've, I've dealt with a fair number of them over the years and you know it's it's it takes a certain kind of person to be able to do this because you're not interacting with the public you're off in your cubicle or your room or wherever you are writing these and so you really don't have touch with um, people in our nation that are experiencing the woes you might right. read the Washington Post which is never going to publish that stuff um, about how how everyday the everyday common person on the street is dealing with these issues and and even if it's in there it doesn't matter they're going to do what they want to do anyway and sure. the problem we have is that when you have to take a look at the chevron doctrine it didn't undo that 40-year chunk Correct. of nonsense it basically said going forward you can't do that anymore right so, so and, and and i think that's i mean it, and let me give you a little little piece that's fascinating um in the in that over the counter kind of thing for the hearing aids, did you know that Bose actually was inside the industry doing a lot of stuff, and Bose has fully exited the you know the over the counter thing. So your primary driver of all of that is exited the industry because they found it too ridiculous for them to work with under was, the particular regulations. They were losing money. It was too burdensome for them. Exactly. And they, <laughs> and, and, but mo most, there's a lot of interesting reasons why, and I can predict it all of them back in 2017 when it was coming out. And, and that's why what, what you're saying so powerfully with the Chevron doctrine. And I just, I, that's what, why you and I had such a connection is that when you look at the Chevron doctrine, it's that dude sitting back there, Writing up a whole bunch of things is never thought about the impact um, of, of whatever he's writing on, in essence. And, and if you know the truth of it, 
there's a lot of people in government agencies at the state and local level that have no concept of what those are. And there'll be some, there'll be some language in there, for example, that says that a state has a responsibility to, I'll give you one example. States have a responsibility when they receive money from the federal government's passed through agencies. Right, they right. have a responsibility to not only maintain a quarterly um, spreadsheet and list of all the property they've spent money on, but it has to be reported to the federal government. And many of them have never heard of that before. So the federal government will come in and they will do what they refer to as a triennial review or a review every three years. And they'll go through their process about, you know, did you follow the regs? And all of a sudden the state gets dinged and says, you guys didn't follow the regs here. Well, what does that so mean? They lose federal monies, right? Well, there. they don't necessarily lose the federal money depending on how egregious it is. What they do is they might find themselves in a position where there is federal oversight. Oh, so they will bring in folks from D.C. to monitor what the state agency is doing. So that takes away their freedom. And at the end of the day, if they find out they didn't spend the funds as they should or didn't take care of them as they should, then they have to repay the funds. Right. OK. So it, so it, it, it can be a real cumbersome problem for states to have to deal with. And so it's one of those things where we have created this this beast, if you will, uh, called the administrative state that is basically gobbling up everything and all the responsibilities that should be falling upon the president and the Congress. And right. all of these agencies are part of the executive branch. And so when FDR and the Democrats created them, they placed all of these agencies under the president. But the vast majority of people operating in these agencies, number one, have no idea who the president is. Number two, the president's not aware of the agencies and what they do. And and that the White House staff that works for whatever executive is in there is many times clueless about this unless someone brings it to the attention of the person working the staff. Right. So it, it creates a real problem for us. So if we talk about something as and I, I'm sorry about jumping around on this, but I would no, say this is wonderful. This today, if, if we look at something as simple as eliminating the income tax or not taxing certain groups of people. So not only do you um, dismember the taxing authority under the IRS, but now <laughs> there's no money to fund all these other agencies. Right. If that's where the money went. If it's not where the money went and we have all the debt structure over here, then you have to go back and attack the agencies that have got all the budgets flow, budget dollars flowing through them. Because, again, they're spending money that are coming from some source and it's actually being added to our debt. So if we if you try and get this this beast under control that, that we call the administrative state, um, it takes such a large effort to do that, that you have to you have to engage in draconian efforts to either take away their money, take away their power, take away their ability to perform what they do. And, and that's and, why they're and, and that's why they're terrified right now. Even I mean, even when Elon kind of made the comment, you know, I'd like to be over, you know, in essence, he basically said, I want to be over the budget and make sure you're in, in budget, in, in essence, and, and auditing this whole thing. And then Trump kind of took up the, the reins. It probably is coordinated. They probably discussed it beforehand. But I find that fascinating because they must be freaking out over there. Well, see, I, I'm sure they are, but a, a little bit of history here. Back in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan called in a friend of his by the name of Peter Grace. And they established the Grace Commission. And the whole purpose of the Grace Commission was to identify problems within government and reduce the size of government. And before they even got the report out, the Chevron Doctrine passed. Oh. So in it's essence, what it, you know, it, it basically uh, thwarted their efforts. And so then you've had the growth of that, that bureaucratic state. Another interesting element that most people are not aware of is that um, you, you take the average, like a trade association or uh, even lobbyists in, in the news media, there's certain people that have access to the floors of the Congress and state legislatures. And, you know, for example, uh, lobbyists can't go on there. Members of the news media can't, but they're limited as the behavior that they engage in. But what's interesting is you can have the executive branch send their legislative liaison to meet with these people. And you can also have administrative agencies send their chief legislative liaison in. So while everybody has to stand out in the hallways waiting for a decision to be made, 
the insiders of the administrative state and or executive office and staff. They, they always get a members of Congress to work against you. Right. Wow. That is, I mean, okay, I'm still learning so much. It's not even funny. Uh, I, I'm sure with that case. I, I think what, if if you were, and, and we'll kind of leave it, I, guys, there are about 14 questions I've got here in my head, but there's a, there's a couple ways we can do this. But what I'd like to do is kind of say, <laughs> take the Chevron doctrine kind of to, you know, what it could be um, as, as it's, as it's exploding upon all of the uh, the three letter agencies, in essence, how would you kind of see its its future? I think one of the immediate uh, changes that's going to take place is that the the court basically said to the Congress, uh, "We're not going to rely on you not identifying what the agencies are doing when you pass laws. You need to be more specific about what they entail." Now. My personal opinion is, is when we take a look at the agencies, we're going to see the agencies working with the Congress to do just enough to get by. And so what that's going to mean is <clears throat> excuse me, we'll have a series of statutes to get passed and the Congress will say within the statutes that the agency will do A, B and C. And so then they'll go through and continue to do the stuff they're doing. But somebody will say, wait a minute, that's not right because you forgot to do D. So what they'll do is they'll go forward and they'll file suit and they'll say under the reversal of a Chevron doctrine, um, again, the Congress gave too much authority to the agency because they said you do A, B, and C, but they left D open, and D is the major part of what the agencies were doing before. So right. there's, there's going to be ongoing litigation as to how far this needs, how far this should go. And the problem is, is that it takes years, it takes money, and it takes a lot of effort to go through and challenge these. Plus, every agency is going to see there's certain elements within that agency where litigation takes place. And, and I say every single agency out there um, it, it will be dealing with this type of issue. It's going to be almost like a full employment bill, if you will, for, for attorneys, for uh, financial consultants, for legislative staff and others that are looking for future employment within the administrative state. I think one of the things that really needs to be done is that someone needs to take a look at whether or not we have allowed the administrative state to run too far afield from what the original intent should be. Because if I look, for example, at the Constitution, and, and I'll give you one example here, the Constitution says that Congress shall control interstate commerce. Interstate commerce has been stretched so far that it no longer exists within the definition that it was originally there. And by that, I mean, when you go to, when you walk into a court of law and you look at something and say, well, that violates interstate commerce, well, how does it? The burden is on you to explain how it does rather than on the Congress explaining why it doesn't. Oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. So so if we have well, it's it's all on me or you know, me and my lawyer to say, you know, that's a problem instead of instead of them saying, wait a second, we did we have the responsibility to yes. deal with that. Right. And, and so so again, and and um I'm not by any stretch of the imagination criticizing attorneys when I say this, no. but it, the, the rule of thumb is that most people don't approach this because they simply don't have the financial resources to do it as an individual, unless their back is against the wall and their livelihood and business are threatened. Right. Uh, they have to make a choice. Is the litigation worth pursuing based upon what it's going to cost me? Right. Or do I find a different way to get around addressing that? Or do I just look at something different to do? And unfortunately, the... Uh, the problem that we run into with with the bar today is that there are a lot of people who have raised rates substantially and most people can't even afford them. Um, I was having a conversation with someone the other day and they made mm -hmm. reference to what they were paying uh, and their attorney and it was well over a thousand dollars an hour. Yeah. And they don't even see the file. They've got staff that's doing it. So he may review what the staff does periodically, but the staff are making between one fifty and three hundred dollars an hour, depending on whether, you know, they're their administrative assistant or whether they're a paralegal or you know, junior junior partner or what have you. So, the pricing of everything that's connected with how you might address this issue is so far over the top that it makes it impossible for someone to step forward and say, "I need to address this issue." Right. They and can't I think do it. 
I think what what I'm going to say to you two guys here as we as we kind of end up here is is two things. I and we'll we'll come back and hit the IRS in another time frame. But you know when Trump has kind of put the IRS under the microscope here, um, and then he's you know we have the secondary point that he didn't do, but SCOTUS um, knocked down uh, the Chevron doctrine. Those two things. Um, are, are going to be crumbling a lot of, of, of essentially a state that's been um, operating in near communist level points throughout the last 40 years. And I, I just think that I, I think there's what's what's cool is there's going to be a lot of opportunity for us to be able to walk in there and say, no, that is wrong. And here is why. And it's the burden is on you. So me, that private citizen walking into, you know, Joe in, 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 in Congress and say, this is wrong and you have to fix it. You don't even have a choice on it instead of them, you know, reversing the role in that way, too. Is that possible, you think? Well, number one, I think it's possible. But again, that that points to another shortcoming we have in our political system. We have individuals who get elected to office. And they, they will run for office and they have grand ideals. They stand on a, on a commitment to do certain things. And by the time they get to their elected office, before long, they get swept up into the behavior, if right. you will, of the institution. And the behavior of the institution causes them to back away from commitments they made to their constituents. Right. Uh, now, I, I will say this. I speak from experience with that, knowing people who've gone through the process. Um, I was I was elect, a locally elected official on my my city council, and I've been heavily involved with uh, recruiting people to run for office. I have given them advice and counsel about not engaging in certain kinds of behavior, mm -hmm. and before long, their career is ruined. And they stood up to somebody. Uh, I I had a friend who uh, came into the process, and he said, "Look, you know, I'm going to do this, this, and this." And he said his goal was dealing with healthcare issues. And I told him, you got to keep your nose clear. You got to keep it clean. And when I say keep your nose clean, I mean stay out of trouble. Right. But so he started out by going to some different fundraisers. And before long, he was going to fundraisers and places outside the community. And before you know it, uh, he pulled his car over and fell asleep because he had too much to drink. And then he got arrested with his pictures taken and ended up having to go to jail. Right. And so at the end of the day, his career was ruined because he did that, but he got someone upset. And that was the payback he had to endure. And so what people don't understand, you either play that game when you go forward, or you run the risk if you don't play it, of something happening down the road. And I'm not saying that happens to everybody, but I've noticed that a lot of people that I believed were stalwarts in supporting certain issues and committed to a cause to bring something forward in a positive way, their 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 stalwartness and their effort got watered down. Right. Well, I mean, talk to them. You find out it's connected to campaign finance. It's having to raise money to get reelected. Sure. It's going to these different activities, and before long, they have lost the purpose of being our elected representative. Well, because themselves, the the campaigning is a constant thing, you know, and it is. Yet you you want to be there, and after a while, you it, it's a drug. And, yes. you know, you, you were going to, you're going to move into that. Um, I guess I was thinking of uh, Corinthians. I, I don't want to say second Corinthians, but I could be wrong on this. It says uh, bad company corrupts good character. And, and when you put people in those kinds of, of den of vipers, in essence, it, you run that risk. You do. And, and yet I think what we're seeing guys is, is the end of that time frame. Um, and, and that's what terrifies all of these people. Um, and uh, that's what, that's what's ter terrifying. You know, you're seeing it in Hollywood, you're seeing it in media, you're seeing it in government, you're seeing it in many of the big corporations. They're absolutely terrified of what the train is. And that train is Trump and all the rest of the things around it. But I believe that Nassara points, you know, also will come in through the military kind of ways because these people have violated, in essence, the Constitution. So that's kind of the thing. Guys, I, I, I want to respect time here, but 
Roger, we got to do this again. We'll, we'll do it again. Um, absolutely. I, I just want to make a couple of quick comments sure, here. On, please, yeah. On, on the role of Ms. Sarah. You know, one of the things that I personally believe needs to happen and is probably our greatest strength as a nation is if people at the local level, and I'm talking about people who firmly understand what our founding fathers met. In other words, you are involved in running for office, you represent your constituency, you go do your job for maybe a, for a two year term, maybe a four year term, and then you come back home to your regular job and you rotate out and let somebody else go in. And you do, that with an, you do that with the understanding that everybody needs to be part of the process. Yeah. And I believe that if you start doing that, you're going to find more people wanting to line up and be involved. You're going to find new ideas. You're going to find fresh approaches. And you're going to find people that are saying, thank you for the opportunity. And the one thing we have to do to get this thing moving down the road, I believe, is to get money out of politics. We need to get rid of the political parties. We need to go back to everyday people having an opportunity to come together, talk right. about their interests and what they feel needs to be done in their community, and then building on it by their associations as individuals and families and neighbors, and building on top of that uh, without having to worry about what everybody else is thinking. Because the goal is to make our neighborhoods, communities, our states, and our government, our federal, uh, uh, the United States of America, a better place to be, our republic. We need to go back to the day where everybody did a job and then went back home after they finished their tenure with the Congress. And until we get to that point, we're not going to solve the problems we have. And I believe that there's more people out there than we can ever imagine who would love to do that if given the opportunity. And that's what we need to focus on. We need to help people understand through education. We need to help them understand through um, confidence in their own skill set. And yep. an understanding that everybody should have the opportunity to step forward and do this if they want to. Leaders will rise out of groups of people on a natural basis if given the knowledge and information they need and the understanding of what it's about. And then the other thing I be believe very strongly about is we have to pray about the direction we want our country to go. We have to make certain it's in sync with God. God put government in charge of his people for a reason. He didn't say a corrupt government. He intended the government to help take care of people's needs as a as a uh, human group, as a body, as a nation. And we have moved so far away from that. If we don't get back to that, I firmly believe we're missing the opportunity. That's what I think Nasera does for us. Yeah. And I, I, I think, guys, and he basically said another point I say to people all the time. I remember a guy, and he was in South Texas, had this really strong accent. I was talking to him on the phone. He was talking about an uh, issue that was really powerful to him. I think it was on uh, petroleum issues, So, if I remember right. And as he was complaining about the mayor, and all I heard is the Holy Spirit saying, dude, you need to be thinking about being the mayor of your city. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. And I'm like... You have no, I mean, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just say, saying to you, we, if you are awakened, you might be awakened for just this opportunity to be in, you know, local government <laughs> to even higher levels of that. Um, that might be something that you need to do. And, and, you know, we are praying behind you because I need, we all need just regular people don't need super lawyers. You don't have to be super finance people. You have to come in with a passion and a love for your country. And that's what Roger just said so well. And you need to have some common sense too, because common right. sense will take you a long way. Right. I mean, the, the, you know, this it's the smell test in essence. Yes. And and most people walk into situations that kind of break it down for me and you hear it and you go, that doesn't, that doesn't pass the smell test. And I think that stuff can happen and happen again with that too. So, it's hey, thanks great. so much, Roger. I really appreciate you. Oh, you're welcome, on. Scott. Anytime. All Take right. Care. Okay. Hey guys, and we appreciate you doing this and we'll, we'll be back with Roger and we'll have a whole bunch of questions. So <clears throat> if you have any comments down there, leave them down there. I will say one thing. You're not going to know his identity and he's not going to be your personal lawyer. Okay. Don't ask that one. It's not going to be the case. What we're trying to do, he has got his own plans and, you know, for his life, and it's not going to be that, okay? So we'll have a lot of fun when we do this. Thanks so much. Thank you.